Well, um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, strange times. I'm getting more and more used to giving presentations um, from my own office to people who I can't see. Uh, so I would encourage you to um, type out any questions you have and put them in the Q&A session. And I'll try and get to them. So um, more so the really than, than, than has ever been possible before, I, I feel sort of a bit um, airlifted into the seminar series because I can't even meet with any of you. So I'm, what I'm really going to be trying to do is give a very broad perspective overview of the technique we use and why it's interesting and why we find it exciting. Um, and hopefully this is going to be as accessible as I can make it for a non-specialist audience. And uh, uh, sorry, I'm just making sure I'm not getting a chat saying that you can't hear me. So, um, what I'm going to be talking about today is understanding how we understand bacterial evolution using 3D electron microscopy techniques. So um, this is from the developing field of really electron cryotomography, which is, is um, enabling us to see the molecular structure of biological machines as they are inside living cells. So, um, just to put this in context for the purposes of the webinar, what I want to get across to you is really a, to what electron cryotomography is. Uh, and then I'm going to take that and build on that, show you what it can do with a couple of biological case studies. I'm a trained biologist, so really I'm excited about the biology, uh, but I'm hoping that the biology will illustrate the power of the technique. So. Um, for this seminar series, as I understand it, it's important for the speakers to get across the challenge. And so um, our challenge is very fundamental and very big picture um, and not what you would necessarily call immediately applied, but huge ramifications in terms of future application. So the challenge is to understand what processes are feeding into the evolution of complex systems. We saw a vast amount of complexity in life on Earth. What is it that's driving that ever spiraling growth of complexity? Why is it that we see this? And so the approach we use as experimental biologists is electron microscopy to get 3D images of the things we're most interested in. We're, uh, I'm a very visual person, so it's important for me to use a visual approach to sort of try to tackle these questions. We're also supplementing this with visible light microscopy. In the space of the time I have for this seminar, I don't really have time to go into our visible light microscopy beyond uh, a single uh, video that I'm going to show you in a couple of slides time. And we're stitching all of this together with hypothesis-driven genetic manipulation to understand uh, some of the basic processes of the biological systems we're studying. So, all very vague. So here's some concrete specifics. This is the biological system we're interested in. This is a fluorescent video microscopy um, video uh, collected by a postdoc in my lab, Eli Cohen, visiting uh, collaborators of ours in Tokyo. And we've dyed the bacterial cell body in red and its flagella filaments in green. Now, the flagella filaments are about 20 nanometer diameter proteinaceous filaments. Uh, for those of you who aren't microbiologists, the cell body itself is about two microns long and one micron across, to give you a sense of, the of scale. And so what we're excited about here is the bacterial flagella motor, which is the actual motor that is spinning this green flagella filament and counter-rotating the cell body to drive motility. This is a cartoon of the bacterial flagella motor. So we've got a literal rotary motor that's spanning the inner and the outer membranes and rotating this long proteinaceous filament that we had stained in green in the previous video to act as a helical propeller to drive flagella motility. Now, what's particularly fascinating about this though, 
is that this flagellar motor is literally a electrochemical potential driven electric motor that measures about 40 nanometers in all, all dimensions that sits in the bacterial membrane. So some key pieces of nomenclature here, we've got the stator complexes, which are the motor complexes that are driving rotation of, um, of the whole flagellar motor. So these stator complexes bind to the peptidoglycan layer and use proton flow rotation of the rest of the, remaining, the remainder of the complex. The other core part of the motor protein is what we call a C ring or a cytoplasmic ring. So this ring sits beneath the stator complexes and the stator complexes harness proton flux through them to drive rotation of this C ring, right? So stator complexes C ring driving that rotation. Another key piece of machinery is what we call a type three secretion system. So the type three secretion system is a large um, self-assembly apparatus that's embedded in the core of the bacterial flagellar motor. <clears throat> so the technique we use is electron cryotomography to study these things. So this is actually a slice through a three-dimensional rendering of an entire cell pole with uh, a, an embedded bacterial flagellar motor. So in electron cryotomography, what we do is we flash freeze our specimen and then take images of it in an electron microscope over a range of angles. We can then take those images and in a manner directly analogous to a CAT scan or a CT scan, we can reconstruct a three-dimensional model of the bacterium. So this is panning up and down through that three-dimensional model of a bacterium that we've computationally derived from a series of images of the bacterium captured over a range of angles. We can zoom in on the flagellar motor. So this is a zoom in. In many ways, this is, a, this is amazing. We're imaging a single molecular machine as it is within the cell at the time of freezing it. But it's very noisy. You can't fail to notice. And so we play an imaging technique where we image many genetically identical motors, superimpose them computationally, and develop the average. And so this is we select many identical particles computationally and then superimpose and average them to get a structure that looks like that, right? So we can start getting at much higher signal to noise ratio images of biological machinery in situ. And then the sort of question we can ask is, well, we think we know what the given component is. So in this example, from many years ago, I thought I knew what this component was. And so I teamed up with collaborators, we remo removed that component from the organism and re-imaged using this electron cryotomographic subtomogram averaging approach. And when you do that on this mutant, what we found was that one density was gone, um, providing pretty compelling, compelling evidence that that density is this component that we call flight I. Okay, so that was some background on the technique. So I'm just gonna really show you what this technique is enabling in terms of, first of all, insights into flagellar evolution. So the fun biology starts when you plot a family tree of bacterial flagellar motors. This is a, 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 a sort of a bush tree of all flagellar motors that we can, we can sample at the moment. <clears throat> and putting in context, uh, these slices through the recon three-dimensional reconstructions uh, we find this amazing amount of diversity. It's sort of a really fun uh, menagerie of um, weird and wonderful family members. And so what we realized is that um, this is really exciting to us because uh, we can actually study the diversity in contemporary machinery, start trying to get at some fundamental principles of deeper evolution. How did this diversity evolve? first question is not how did the diversity evolve but sort of this why diversity why is a dangerous phrase in biology biological terms because it uh imp implies purpose uh so maybe a more accurate biological phrasing is what is the selective benefit of this diversity and so the first thing that sprung out to us that we pursued was well maybe it's sim simply a matter of changing the ability of these bacteria to swim so you can put three different species um, in their natural growth medium and they, they all swim quite happily. But if we increase the viscosity of the environment of different species, that different viscosity, in this case by adding 40% glycol, 
affects motility to different degrees. So in this case, you can see that the Campylobacter is still very capable of swimming, despite being um, swim, swimming in 40% vital, whereas these other species are essentially immobilized by 40% vital. So we wondered, does this simply mean that the Campylobacter flagellomotor has evolved to produce higher torque to enable it to swim through more viscous environments? And so to test this, what we started doing was using this tomography imaging together with genetic manipulation to ask various questions about the architecture of these species. <clears throat> so here's a two-dimensional slice through a, a three-dimensional reconstruction of the salmonella motor. We can see the width of its C-ring. It's about uh, 20 nanometers in radius. And perhaps Unsurprisingly, given, given some knowledge I'm about to describe, we don't see any stator complexes where we would expect to see them, where they would be binding to the purpose of the layer and accepting protons to drive rotation. <coughs> so there's indirect evidence from biophysicists around the world that there are 11 stator complexes in the Salmonella flagella motor. We moved on then to uh, the Vibrio fisheri flagellomotors. The Vibrio flagellomotors are um, quite interesting in that when we examined it in more detail with our collaborator, Ned Ruby, we saw that the C-ring is slightly wider. <coughs> on top of that, we do see densities where we would expect to see the state of complexes. And so what we thought was that these 13-fold symmetries, in this case, were probably the state of complexes so we asked Ned to step in, do some genetics, delete those components, and we re-imaged them. And indeed, we saw that those structures are gone. So we conclude that the Vibrio motor has a slightly wider C-ring and slightly more state complexes than Salmonella. We repeated this in Campylobacter with our collaborator, Dave, ne Dave Hendrickson. <coughs> the C-ring is much wider in Campylobacter and many more state complexes as confirmed by deletion. Now, the elephant in the room is, though, uh, that's shown us some, some nuances of the underlying architecture of these motors. It didn't really tell us anything about these additional components. And so, again, uh, teaming up with Ned and Dave and some sophisticated genetic analyses I don't really have time to describe, uh, we were able to, this is summarizing years worth of work, put the pieces together and build a hierarchy of assembly, uh, um, uh, a hierarchy of assembly and identification of different components. The important take home message from this slide though is that moat B, which is a stator complex component, is only ever assembled into these motors in the presence of all of their additional components. And so we interpret, interpret that to mean is that the, these additional structures that we see that I've been showing us pulling apart here, have evolved to play the role of a scaffold structure to scaffold wider rings of additional state of complexes. <clears throat> I'm just going to hint at where we're going now. We're building family trees of flagella motors and putting these motors in context of the trees to try and say something intelligent about the potential order of the evolutionary process. You may be able to see here that we've see, we seem to see an increasing uh, in, intensity in terms of the and the number of stator complexes here. So I've got a Q&A question. Uh, what is the dark circle that gives the extra density, density next to the flagella motor? Um, so I think you mean that dark circle in the middle on the right hand side. Uh, that's actually a cross section um, through the, um, the actual flagella motor itself. So, um, what we're going to see, what we see what we can do now is we can um, we can I can't dismiss the Q and A system excuse me okay um, and so what we can do is we can actually put the pieces together and do some very basic physics. Basic physics is that torque is equal to the lever length multiplied by the force applied by the state complexes. Now, we've got the lever length by the zeroing radius. We've got the number of force applying units by the symmetry we see. Biophysicists have, me have measured force. And so 
we've got a few different data points here. And what we can actually do is we can take our structures and see, do our structures correspond to measured torques by biophysicists? And if they do, what this tells us is something, is this actually gives us a structural rationale for how these different molecular machines produce different torques. And so we can plot the calculated maximum torque from our structure against the observed ma maximum torque from biophysicists. And there are a few nuances to this graph, but bottom line is our structures magnificently explain these differences in torque in different species. Okay, so what I can summarize from that is that what the electron cryotomography as a technique has enabled is that it has enabled um, throughput um, <clears throat> development of uh, data collection techniques, um, which has in turn enabled sort of this bolting on of uh, extra proteins that are scaffolded. Um, and sorry, playing around with this. And in turn um, has shown that um, these extra proteins have played a role of scaffolding wider motors to produce higher torque. Okay, so that's a biological insight. The second of two stories I'm going to tell you about the technique is that tomography really enables insights into flexible, transient molecular structures that you would have no chance of studying if we tried to purify them outside of their cellular context. So let me just remind you of this experiment where I thought I knew what this component was. I thought it was a protein called fly I. I deleted fly I and we saw that, that disappeared. And that gave evidence that this structure is fly I. And so we built on that later. We thought that this toroidal density here was a docking platform composed of either FLHA or FLHB. Now we were approached before we could test this our own um, by collaborators, Susan Lee, who's in Oxford, who had a, the crystal structure of a homologue of FLHA. So that gave us a, this is a top view, there's a donut structure. So it was very strong, su strongly suggested this donut structure in our cryotomograms, this so-called docking platform, must be FLHA. And so to test that, they're the same dimensions, what we did is we focused on this, we removed FLHA's cytoplasmic domain, and what we saw was that indeed that donut exclusively disappeared within the area uh, delimited by the red box. Everything outside didn't as assemble because FLHA is an essential mechanistic component of the assembly process. We weren't surprised by that, but what was significant was that this, this red box changed exclusively by loss of this toroidal density compelling evidence that, that that toroid was FLHA. We control FLHB produced no difference. And so, okay, we're pretty sure this torus is fly FLHA, but we were then struck by this really curious observation that fly I seems suspended in mid-air, in mid-cytoplasm, even when lacking this FLHA density. And so what, um, here's some biological specifics here. What's interesting is that this whole structure, FLHA, fly I, have homology to a, another biological machine called the FATPase. And the FATPase has a homologue to a, uh, a flagella protein called fly H that led us to speculate that what fly H may be doing is that it is an anchor that holds fly I in place despite lack of FLHA as a docking platform. I'm just going to remind you of this again. The C-ring can have different radii. And what Stephen Johnson from our collaborator Susan Lee's lab noticed was that the length of the protein fly I correlates with this C-ring diameter in different species. And so you can plot fly I length from different species against the C-ring diameter in that species. And what you see is this beautiful um, correlation. We certainly were pretty su surprised by that correlation. Um, <clears throat> so um, I've just got a, a couple of questions come through. I'm just going to quickly see if there's anything that um, I should address now. <clears throat> right, there was a question about what is the function of fly I and um, what the was the structure I removed? Was that fly I? So, 
just going back to my slides. Yes, this density, um, I, I think I've answered your question. The density at the base is flight I. And that's held in place by flight H. And we, so our, we hypothesize if we remove flight H from the genome, flight I would disappear. This was the work of Tay and Louis from my lab. And indeed, when you remove fly H, fly I disappears. And so what we speculate is happening, and this is the model, is that fly I in the center is anchored by um, arms on the sides. And what that enables is that fly I functions as an ATPase for those biologists in the audience, as an ATPase to recruit unfold and export structural components of the growing flagellum, right? So it's a, a part of the self-assembly apparatus. Okay, so I'm conscious of time here. So we've moved on to other work. Uh, this is again, the work of Tegan Louis, where we've kept on deleting parts of the, parts of the C ring and we see different responses to fly eye, different things disappearing. But my cartoons on the right are really meant to illustrate and I don't have time to talk about this much depth now, meant to illustrate the fact that you've got lots of transient dynamics here and we can only really see it in situ if we were to purify these things, we would lose all details. And so we can start developing quite sophisticated molecular models for actually the, the molecular architecture of this structure. And then just as a final slide, this is a paper that was in revision actually when I made the slide but was accepted for publication two days ago, um, that Florian was very interested in transient binding of signaling proteins. So Florian focused on a, another species, a species called Colobacter crescentus, which has some quite interesting aspects to it. And <clears throat> imaged it, this is a 3D re uh, rendering of the Colobacter uh, flagellar motor. And then he added a signaling protein called CLE-D and we were able to actually directly visualize the binding of CLE-D around the edge of the C-ring in Colobacter. I better call it quits, but um, what I hope I've tried to get across to you guys as, um, as, a, as a probably quite diverse audience is that what cryotomography is enabling us as biologists is insights into deciphering fragile in situ molecular structures, imaging destabilized mutant structures that we might never be able to purify and to ambient transient biologically relevant binding events in the cell. Um, the next steps is to massively improve our resolution um, and we're building on that by essentially increasing throughput, increasing image quality. And really at, at bottom line, what we're doing is studying previously intractable biological molecular systems. Uh, I'd like to say thanks to a few people, a few people in lab, um, Charles at the back there has been invaluable in insights into our um, core working methodology, although I have to say that despite a stellar publication record, he hasn't published much recently. Um, many collaborators have enabled uh, all of this over the last years. We've got a, a Twitter feed there. I'm happy if you'd like to follow us. And I'd be really happy to answer questions in the Q&A. Okay, so some questions here. <clears throat> um, uh, one uh, anonymous attendee, what do you mean by the flagellar motor? Sorry, I should have tackled that right at the beginning. Um, the flagellar motor I define as the large macromolecular structure that assembles, that spans both of the membranes of the bacterium. Uh, the flagellum itself is a long passive tail attached to this flagellar motor. So I, I think this 40 nanometer structure in the membranes as being the motor itself. And that's literally a rotary electrochemical motor. Why did the diameter change? I'm afraid I'm not absolutely sure um, what you're referring to there, but I'm gonna presume, Arisa, that you're talking about the C-ring diameter. We don't actually know the molecular determinants behind how different species have produced C-rings of different radii. Uh, I've got uh, a PhD student in lab, Tina Drobnik, who's beginning to ask some questions about that, but it's, um, it's a hard question. Uh, we're working on it. That we think that some, pro some organisms have incorporated additional stator proteins, sorry, uh, sorry, spacer proteins 
the scaffold a wider C ring, but then and which then corresponds with this uh, wider ring of stator complexes, which are scaffolded by these proteins that we've been studying. <clears throat> Okay, what is the function of FLHA, fly I? Fly I is an ATPase. We don't exactly know what it's doing, but it's using ATP hydrolysis in some way to speed up the efficiency of the self assembly process. FLHA is there's a, this, this cytoplasmic domain and this donut shaped, sort of donut shaped cytoplasmic domain and the transmembrane domain. We think FLHA is, is a sport cage, we call it, that um, concentrates the secretion substrates and then uses proton flux across the inner membrane to couple that to some sort of maybe peristaltic um, pumping of proteins across the membrane. Um, right, is cryotomography a post-staining method? Uh, post-staining in the sense of post-modern? Yes. Uh, post-staining in the sense of after-staining? No. We use no chemical stains, no chemical fixatives. Our cells are preserved by flash freezing them into a liquid cryogen. And we get contrast by phase contrast using aberrations in the, in the electron optics. Another question, how is torque related to the bacterium? Um, the simple answer is uh, bacteria that need to live in very viscous environments uh, tend to have wide searing high torque motors? The long answer is we have no clue. Um, there's a lot of confusing stuff out there. Campylobacter lives in high viscosity medium, and so unsurprisingly it has a high, high torque motor. It's closely related to bacteria that live in marine sediments, and we can have no rationale for why that might need to be high torque. Question from Ethel here, thanks Ethel. Um, uh, can the flagellum assembly change in different media and conditions? We've never seen that. Many people ask us that. Um, we don't have the capacity to do anything about that at the moment. It's a great question that many people have asked us in the past. Um, all we can say, we had a paper out last year which showed that in different media, under starvation conditions, some bacteria can eject um, <clears throat> their, their flagellum. Um, Okay, another uh, question. Do you find even bigger differences between polar and peritrichus flagella? Was their evolution different? Great question. We think the polar and peritrichus flagella are actually both relatively closely related in terms of, um, for example, Pseudomonas E. coli salmonella. Um, we've got a paper out about that. The polar motors seem to have evolved additional stabilizer structures, which may be something to do with wider rings of additional state complexes, more permanently incorporated state complexes instead of dynamic state complexes. Um, we are working on a phylogeny at the moment. Watch this space, follow our Twitter feed. Uh, Navish, thanks for your comment. Um, given that torque is a product of radius and the number of state complexes, which is, which is itself proportional to radius, this would predict that the torque is proportional to radius squared, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Do you see that in that in torque measurements? Yes. If you go back to our 2016 paper, very roughly, we th we're surprised how well it corresponds, and we suspect uh, we've had some systematic errors in our favor. Uh, but the salient features of our model, we stand by. We think they are solid. Great question about do you believe your research can help fight the issue of antibacterial resistance, right? Obviously, I'm very interested in fundamental biology here. I've been shoehorned a bit into this, and I'm grateful that the organizers invited me. Um, I think the really obvious uh, response to that question is that we've got this zoo of different um, flagella motors here. And so what this brings um, into possibility is potentially devising drugs that specifically dismantle or jam the assembly of specific types of flagella motor. So the friendly E. coli in our guts can continue swimming, but the detrimental Campylobacters and Helicobacters in our guts are specifically selectively disabled by a drug designed based on our structural biology. Um, I hope that helps. 
Um, Leah, please let me know if I should stop talking. I'm just going to keep on asking these questions, answering these questions as they come in. And also, guys, if you're done listening to me talk, please feel free to log off. But I appreciate you remaining here. Um, next question Do you have the resolution yet to compare between different Campylobacter species? So I've glossed over the technology a lot. The resolutions of our structures are to best at the moment about 40 angstroms. So very low by traditional structural biology techniques. Um, our best resolution so far is 33 angstroms. That was PhD student Josie Ferreira last year. Uh, we're pushing for much higher. In that. Um, so detailed insight into specific complexes. Our current approach is we hope to get a mixture of crystal structures, single particle analysis structures, tomography structures, and stitch them together uh, using our own uh, uh, brute intelligence, which is somewhat lacking at points. So let's hope we can get a higher resolution soon. Okay. Um, are there similar motors for other structures? Um, I'm not quite sure what the question is. I'm going to say that um, the bacterial flagella motor is unique. It is totally, totally unrelated to what we call the eukaryotic cilium or flagellum, which we find in lung hairs or in sperm totally unrelated. So the flagella motor, as we study it, the bacterial flagella motor is, uh, is a unique structure. Question, what viscous environment are you using for your sample? So the results I showed you were in FICOL, which is roughly speaking a Newtonian fluid. Uh, we can do this though in methyl cellulose, which is far from Newtonian, um, behaves um, much more viscously at higher speeds. And what we see is actually that um, these bacteria swim differently in FICOL environments to compared to methylcellulose. Campylobacter actually seems optimized to high viscosity environments using long chain, uh, long linear polymers. Is there a link between antibiotic resistance and the motility of the flagellum? We've not seen a link between the actual resist antibiotic resistance and flagellum structure simply because antibiotic resistance usually uses a technique other than motility. So it will use an enzymatic motility to break down an antibiotic or to pump an antibiotic out. So they tend not to be correlated yet, but we might see some approach to antibiotic resistance that incorporate a flagellum or are correlated. Okay, great question about an anonymous attendee about uh, the structure of flagellar motors being used for synthetic biology. So some people have done some really, really, really cool. Uh, I think I've, <clears throat> in my speaker dropped out there, um, uh, where you can shuttle cargoes by uh, um, tethering them to live bacteria. Some cool stuff there. We could use bacterial flagellar motors potentially as microfluidic mixing machines at some point, as well as payload delivery. Um, <clears throat> that's sort of, so I think very clear gripping synthetic biology questions. Next attendee, have you contributed to COVID-19? Great question. I haven't, to be brutally honest. There are many other better, pe better people qualified to do this than me. Uh, the Crick Institute is running uh, 24 7, as I understand it, imaging COVID 19 using electron cryotomography. So, we might see uh, some studies of actual coronavirus inside living cells. That might be an application which would be really exciting. Hi, um, good morning. Focal microscopy. Oh, sorry. Um, I just wanted to say maybe we could take um, two more questions and um, looking at time. Sure thing, sure okay. thing, absolutely. Yeah, I've actually only got two more questions, so very quickly. Uh, in terms of drugs that are designed to attack the flagellar motors, do you think flagellar are necessary for survival? Um, what we'd be seeing is that if you can attack a flagellum, um, we would immobilize the bacterium to the point where it would be out-competed by uh, enteric bacteria that are natural inhabitants. So strictly speaking, this would be a bacteria stat, but it would lead to elimination of uh, the immobilized bacterium. Campylobacter needs a flagellum to cause its disease. So. And then Navish, back to you again. Um, okay, great, Navish, thanks for your comment. Appreciate it. Uh, yes, indeed, uh, would love to meet you sometime.
Thank you very much for all your questions, guys. Thanks for listening. I appreciate it. Um, drop me an email if you have anything else.